Yes, Clamor, YouTube channel. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. And in today's video, we're going to be looking at more 100 things they don't want you to know. Conspiracies, mysteries and unsolved crimes. Now, a little secret, usually I'm really, really good at like keeping up with videos. However, I worked all weekend last weekend. I worked like, I think it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Sounds like a fun one. <laughs> and I don't think we've done the one about Edgar Allan Poe, so maybe that's a cool one to do. And then we can move on to Michael Fetherty up in flames. Yeah, we'll do these. So, strap in, get ready, I'm about to sneeze. There we go, right. Um, I have, I'm trying to drink as much liquids as I can. And I say liquids because you can't drink solids, can you? I suppose soup, all those soups are liquid, I don't know. So I'm really trying to drink like up to five litres a day. And, well, starting today that is anyway. I've got two big bottles in my fridge, but I'm going to be drinking from this. Just to really help me. But also I feel like, I feel like I need some chewing gum. that side of Canada. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. So like Vancouver. Victoria. And obviously Washington is the state down to the left. Okay, fair 
studies. Right, okay, let's carry on. The Salish Sea is a complex of waterways extending from southwest British Columbia in Canada to the northwest point of Washington State. On the 20th of August, only was that, 11, 12 days away from one of my birthdays. I'd have been 10. I'd have been 10 on that birthday. That's cool. A, a girl spotted a size 12 trainer. A size 12 trainer that had washed up on the shores of British Columbia. Jedediah Island. Fun fact. No, ignore me. Uh, inside was a sock. And inside that was a man's foot. It was the first in the series, a series of macabre discoveries. That gave rise to a sort of dog theories. It was if, if that first find was disconcerting. The discovery of a second foot three weeks later, this time on, I want to say Gibrolia or Gibrolia, Gibrolia, we'll go Gibrolia, also in British Columbia, provoked a real concern. But this was just, what was it the other foot? Because if they found one foot, that's like either a right foot or a left foot. Maybe they just found another one. Oh, another foot was found on the Valdez Islands. British Columbia in February 2008 so a little while later sparking a rush that saw a further four emerge by the end of the year including in August the first on US shorelines as of May 2014 more than 10 feet had been discovered on the coast of British Columbia and a further four in Washington state Like it. 
Kim says th the shoes and in case feet and help with buoyancy and survive them parts are the only ones that survive. Moving on, we have the strange death of Edgar Allan Poe. Now, apologies if I've already done this. It sounds like something I would have done, but I can't remember and I can't really recollect doing it. So, the mystery. Who or what killed one of the great American men of letters? 7th of October, 1849. As author of stories including The Murders in the Room, letter. Edgar Allan Poe was an early master in the literary mystery, yet perhaps the greatest mystery he bequeathed us in yet perhaps the greatest mystery he bequeathed us is the one surrounding his death. In October 1840, who is it? There's a YouTube channel where they, it's like they do like mystery and they go and they know where it is and now no one knows where he may live. It really bugs me. Anyway, in October 1840, he was discovered in Baltimore in a disheveled state and never recovered. But how did he become to be such a fun? How did he come to be in such a vulnerable condition? On the 3rd of October 1840, one Joseph Walker came across Poe outside a tavern. Apparently delirious and, in Walker's own words, in great distress and in need of immediate assistance. Walker contacted Dr. Joseph Snodgrass, eh, Snodgrass, he plays for Villa, who knew the author, and Poe was soon under the care of Dr. John Joseph Moran.
a suitably poetic last offering, maybe, but one that does rather stretch credibility. You're not wrong on that, sir. Snodgrass was a little better, claiming Walker's initial letter had described Poe as in a state of beastly intoxication. It did not. Snodgrass was a great supporter of the temperance movement, and it served his political ends to show how even a figure as celebrated as Poe could be brought low by evil liquor. The idea that Poe had succumbed to the devil drink was also propagated by the murky figures of Rufus Wilmer Griswold. He owns a bank, doesn't he? Sound of a smoke alarm. 
seeing smoke billowing from Verge's house, he immediately sought the aid of the emergency services. When the fire brigade broke into the property, they were met with a sorrowful sight. Mr. Verge lay dead in his living room floor, on his living room floor, his body badly burnt. Yet mixed in with the sense of tragedy was a feeling of utter puzzlement. The property itself bore hardly any signs of fire damage, save for the floor on which the body lay and the ceiling above. Furthermore, after a thorough inspection of the building, the fire brigade found no evidence of any accelerants, and nothing that led to them to think the Verity had been a victim of foul play. It is true that the corpse lay close to an open fire, <laughs> but investigators were satisfied that this was not the cause of the fatal blaze either. An ink after the camp. An inquest into the death convened in September 2011 under the guidance of the coroner of Westcott. The spot called way wrong for Chloe. Chloe Man. Dr. Kieran McLaughlin. Having bored over experts' testimony in assorted academic texts, he reached an astounding conclusion. This fire was thoroughly investigated, and I am left with the conclusion that it fits into the category. Into the category of spontaneous human combustion, for which there is no adequate explanation. In his 25 years of experience, he had never recorded a verdict like it. So, what is spontaneous human combustion? In short, it's an event where a person bursts into flames despite the apparent absence of an external heat source. It bursts into flames. The first recorded episode dates to 1663 when a Parisian woman was said to have gone up in smoke, even while the straw bed on which she was sleeping remained intact, while as alive. However, many within the scientific community consider the idea of spontaneous human combustion as nothing more than hokum. One alternative theory is that victims succumb to what's known as the wick effect. In these cases, it's argued a heat source such as a cinder or cigarette ash sets the victim's clothing alight. At the same at the same time, somewhat gruesomely, the skin splits to expose fatty deposits. So that the clothing acts as a wick, and the fat as candle wax. In this way, the fire burns as long as there's fat to feed it, but then dies out, leaving the surrounding environment untainted. That's all well and good, except the some uneducated cases of spontaneous human combustion victims whose internal organs show no sign of fire damage. <laughs> Furthermore, in the case of Michael, I can't say last name, Fahirdi, the coroner explicitly ruled out the fireplace as the source of the blaze, as there was no reported alternative heat source, and there was no reported alternative heat sources. And while spontaneous human combustion is by no means a common Precedent. There have been around 200 reported cases in the last three centuries. From all coroners of the globe, an American Frank Baker. Oh, an American Frank Baker is one of a very rare group who claimed to have survived an episode. According to Baker, he was preparing to go on a fishing trip with a friend in the mid-1980s. While sitting on a sofa, he suddenly went up in flames. He relates as the flames engulfed him. He and his friend were able to smother them before they could do much lasting damage. His doctor allegedly told him that the fire had burned from the inside out. It is a characteristic of humanity that we fear death, our powerlessness to ultimately evade it, its unpredictability and sometimes seemingly uh, seeming randomness. For many, the idea of death by spontaneous human combustion is about as bad as it gets. It also fits the bill for the kind of death that science does not much like, one that may not rationalise and thus count, may not be rationalised and thus counted. But surely it is folly to believe that something does not exist simply because science is yet to understand it. <coughs> this one is another interesting one, isn't it? I reckon. Fuck it, yeah, I reckon he might have done it. Why not? Why not, guys? I reckon he might have spontaneously combusted. If they're adamant that there's no foul play, then that's the only thing, isn't it? Right. Just because. 
because science doesn't say it doesn't exist doesn't mean it doesn't exist. No, just because science doesn't 